The following program deals with a controversial subject. The theories expressed are not the only possible interpretation. The viewer is invited to make a judgment based on all available information. Tonight on Sightings, from deep beneath the earth, are these the voices of the dead? Is this family being haunted by ghostly victims of a murder-suicide? He just stood there like um, he was watching her tuck me in. Could these photographs be proof that a woman was molested by a ghost? What we saw, we were able to get on film. And using his video camera, this man claims that he has contacted his dead child. It's an opportunity to witness things that we've been taught all our life cannot be. It's a connection with the unknown. Do ghosts exist? One in 10 Americans claims to have seen or been in the presence of a ghost. Are these people dreaming, hallucinating, or are they actually experiencing spirits from another dimension? Hello, I'm Tim White. I'll be your host for Sightings. Tonight, ghosts. According to a Gallup poll, one in four Americans believes in ghosts. What you'll see tonight might contradict what you think you know about ghosts. The perception most of us have of ghosts was manufactured in Hollywood, where until recently, the paranormal has been treated as a source of either light-hearted comedy or heavy-handed horror. One of Hollywood's most recent attempts at treating the paranormal in a more sophisticated fashion resulted in the surprise blockbuster, Ghost. TV and movies are chock full of eerie and eye-opening effects, but you won't see any Hollywood-style ghosts tonight. What you will see is concrete evidence that something is there, and you'll share the real-life experiences of people who have witnessed apparitions, hauntings, and poltergeists. They were ordinary people leading ordinary lives until they were touched by an unexplainable force. And obviously it frightened me. So I just stood there and looked at it and it disappeared into the wall. I saw a silhouette of somebody watching my room. The feeling of fingers moving up and down your arm. She was floating horizontally up and down in front of the window. And I ran in a room to find her bed elevated off the floor about maybe a foot, foot and a half. You could not see through him. It, it was solid. And I had the feeling that somebody was trying to um, enter my body or make a contact with me in some way. About a foot from my bed was standing a ghost. Whatever they are, whatever you call them, ghosts, spirits, shades, specters, apparitions, there is not a corner of the world they do not inhabit. From this haunted castle in England to this haunted house in Hawaii, a Bavarian monastery, an Italian apartment, mansions in the south, taverns in the west, from this farmhouse all the way to the White House, we have a fascination with ghosts. But I have to tell you, I am puzzled because every once in a while, our little dog Rex will start down that long hall toward that room just glaring as if he's seeing something and barking and he stops in front of Lincoln's door, the bedroom door, and would not go in the room. One of the most interesting things about this phenomena is that it's not culturally dependent. For example, leprechauns are seen only in Ireland, gargoyles in Eastern Europe, but haunting or ghost phenomena has been reported in all cultures since the beginning of time. How do you turn myth and legend into scientific fact. The search for photographic evidence has produced many hoaxes, but a handful of pictures defy explanation. Startling images, spectral apparitions. Are these people from the past trying to make contact with the present? There's a lot of fraud in this. There's a lot of imagination. There's a lot of wishful thinking. But when you strip that all out, there's about 20% 
hardcore stuff that is exceedingly difficult to explain. Within that 20% haunted Longleat Castle in England. In 1965, a film crew in search of a ghost set up an infrared movie camera. After hundreds of hours of filming, they captured this extremely rare moment, a light emerging from one door and disappearing into another. All the lighting conditions were controlled. The windows were blacked out. There was no possibility of moonlight or car headlights or anything coming through. Um, when we saw the stuff later, there was a shaft of light which is, to me, is completely unexplainable. And indeed, this paranormal phenomenon has remained unexplained for 35 years. This New Orleans mansion's haunted history is chronicled in diaries written over 100 years ago. The family that originally lived here buried their dead infant in the wall of the nursery. The ghost of that baby's nanny is said to haunt the house to this day, a benevolent spirit watching over the people who live here now. I've had dinner parties since she'd walked through the room. Everybody at the dinner table would see her. She just ignores you. She just walks through as though no one's there. She never looks at you. Um, nothing, she just walks through. But there's a darker side to the hauntings here. Other ghosts who the residents say are not kind but malevolent. Two family dogs, a male and a female, have been recent victims. The female jumped out of the second floor window uh, to the ground uh, below, and the, the male was dead in the, in the solarium no marks or anything else he was just dead but there was obvious signs of them trying to get out they had clawed their way halfway through a wooden door something had frightened them to that point of, of mass hysteria when the apparition resembles somebody who used to live in the house it seems to be evidence of survival but there's another explanation and that is that it's just energy recorded in the environment that gets played back by our brains, kind of acting like a, like a needle on a phonograph. And perhaps that's what may be happening on this abandoned aircraft carrier, the USS Cabot. The ghostly forms of crewmen who met with violent death in World War II have been seen again and again. One witness who had a chilling encounter on board was Jill Alexander. When I turned, I was looking at a man in a uniform. It was, it was an incredible feeling and I, I couldn't speak, I couldn't move, and my friend kept pulling me to go up the stairs, and I said, Barry, you're gonna think I'm crazy, but I think I'm looking at a ghost, and when I said that, he just took off with me, and we flew down the boat. Uh, the evidence we have is as strong as the witnesses that we have. You have to take a look, start taking a look at witness testimony. Now, many people in social science will say that a human witness is not a good witness, and yet our entire legal system seems to be based on that. And interestingly, the one place where ghosts have been proven to exist is in a court of law. When Jeff and Patrice Stembowski bought this house in Nyack, New York, the owner didn't tell them her house was haunted. Two weeks after buying the house, they wanted out. They sued to get their money back, and a New York appellate court ruled in their favor. That scared me. I can't live in any place that someone's telling me that it's haunted and, and ghosts leave things around for people and close doors and shake beds and things. And you know, in New York State, there really is not a disclosure law for the seller. It's buyer beware. And you, you know, when you buy a house and there's something wrong, if you haven't checked it out, then that has to be your responsibility. Uh, in this case, uh, clearly, ghosts fall into a different uh, category. The owner had claimed for years that her house was haunted, and that was proof enough for the court. Their definition of a haunted house is, if the owner says it's haunted, then it's haunted. She can't come back to court to dispute that fact later on. So, to my knowledge, it is America's only legally haunted house. Coming up next, an average American family that claims their home is haunted by the ghostly victims of a murder-suicide. I haven't been alone in the house since that time. By and large, people who believe that they've encountered a ghost are frightened. So beyond gathering evidence, a critical role for the ghost investigator is crisis counselor to reassure people that they're not losing their sanity. You're about to meet a typical American family. They're ordinary people caught in the grips of an extraordinary situation. In 1985, the Brown family purchased this Victorian era home in Portland, Oregon. It seemed to be a perfect place to raise a young family. When we first moved into the house, I got this strange feeling like 
We were never alone. Perhaps the eerie history of the house played a role. In 1973, the house was the scene of a grisly murder-suicide. A distraught husband shot and killed his wife and then turned the gun on himself, a crime of passion that left their five children orphans. I decided, OK, it happened. We'll just forget about it. Then when things started happening, I started really wondering, was it them? It had to have been them, a husband and a wife. At first, the disturbances were minor. Lights going on and off, trouble with the VCR and electrical outlets. Occurrences easily dismissed as typical in an old house. But no one could dismiss what daughter Cassie saw. Two apparitions, a woman tucking Cassie's blankets into the bed and a strange man lurking in the background. There was um, a guy standing by the door. Um, I was really um, sort of afraid of him because he did nothing. He just stood there like um, he was watching um, um, her tuck me in or um, something. After the third time, her coming to me with the lady tucking her in, I decided to kind of check while they're asleep, check their beds to see. And it was, it was tucked in, in between the mattresses. I don't do that. It sounds like that what's being reported are figures that interact. They are therefore seemingly self-conscious, self-aware, which would be would place them in the category of apparitions or ghosts. Initially, Caroline wondered if it was all in her head. I didn't understand why this was going on. It was kind of confusing. You know, you try to look for the logical explanations. And so, to me, it had to have been me, even though it was something I didn't do. And then when I started really paying attention and watching, I knew I wasn't doing it, and I knew no one else was doing it. Since 1985, the Browns have experienced over two dozen ghostly episodes. Footsteps, voices, flying objects. Once, a space heater was mysteriously plugged in and turned on to warm the children. Family pets refuse to stay inside when no one's home. The family says much of the haunting occurs on or around the anniversary of the murder-suicide, December the 23rd. I went down to the landing and um, I saw someone by the Christmas tree. And I thought it was Santa, so um, so I jumped, so I jumped up and clapped my hands, and um, and they turned around and, and it surprised me, and um, and they disappeared somehow. I don't know. The hall lights always left on for the kids and everything, and my door was left open a little bit. I woke up and I saw the silhouette of a man coming towards me. My first thought is, intruder. I gotta get the light on, get the gun. I had to react. So I'm watching. I'm watching this, and we have the lights that have the rope down from the ceiling. So I'm scrambling, looking for that, keeping this sight, you know, this person in sight, ready to fight, ready to do anything I needed to do. Got the light on, it was gone. The incidents in the house have not been limited to the immediate family. I was on the second floor um, cleaning and I was to take some boxes of excess toys up to the third floor. I was sleeping on the uh, uh, couch, I think it was like kitty corner from the door. I was upstairs, a kid had taken the two children to school and there was no one in the house. I heard a woman shriek. I heard shouting that woke me up. I heard the steps footsteps, fairly heavy ones, going upstairs to the third floor. And then there was some movement on top of a box that was already sitting there on the floor. I uh, saw the silhouette of a man and a woman. I haven't been alone in the house since that time. It was hard for me to, you know, accept because it was so real. You know, when you're so positive someone is there, and no one, I oh, know, very unusual. But for all the occurrences, the family has never really felt threatened. Nothing's happened that's been real negative. It's been nerve-wracking. <laughs> but anything that's happened like to the kids has been positive. Um, sort of like taking care, you know, making sure, watching over them. Me, it, even though you get nervous, you just decide, hey, this is my house. I want to live here and you deal with it. 
Lloyd Auerbach is the co-founder of the Office of Paranormal Investigations. He specializes in helping families through haunting situations, and he recently investigated this case. This is a real interesting case because of the sheer number of witnesses that we have, the testimony from them seems very good. The folks are very, very normal. And I like their attitude that, yeah, they've been a little uncomfortable, but they're living with it and are taking control that they have really done all the right things without us even being here to begin with, to just intuitively. Caroline's first instinct was to comfort her children and to try to eliminate the anxiety that comes with the unknown. What Cassie does to deal with her fear, mm -hmm. we have bells hanging up. She rings this before climbing into bed. <laughs> then she comes up here, rings this bell. With the children, Auerbach stresses the importance of treating the haunting as a game. Special toys can help alleviate fears. Caroline has devised her own combination of lavender and water that Cassie can use to fend off ghosts. It's important to set ground rules both with the ghosts, but certainly with the kids so that they understand how to deal. With yeah, this. well, I've told the ghosts. In fact, it was the last time that um, Cassie had seen him, the man in our room. The next day, I got up and I walked around saying, you will not show yourselves to the kids. You will not do any pranks around the kids. You will not scare them. Mm -hmm. I think that with a, with a situation with a murder-suicide, you have obviously heavy emotion that's put into play here. If we're dealing with apparitions in this case, where they're a little self-conscious and self-aware, the reasons why they're staying around are their reasons. They're not because they died in a murder-suicide. I feel like the couple is somehow grounded here. I'm not an expert, I don't know. I can just guess. They like being with the kids, I think. I feel like maybe they miss their own kids. I mean, that's, you know, a lot of kids to leave behind. So, and somehow they feel a little bit more comforted, maybe, being with mine. And we're a family, and I think they like family atmosphere. Whether they're really ghosts there or not, this taking control, this responsibility issue on the part of the living family that's there, has worked. We can't prove from uh, the perspective of we can't point a, a meter at these ghosts and say that they're there, but we can say that the subjective experience of the family has been dealt with in a way that makes them feel comfortable and that resolves to the point that they want. When you're going through it, it'll make a believer out of you. <laughs> when you have all these unexplainable things and you start seeing figures, you, you change your mind real quick. Coming up next, researchers who claim they have contacted the dead and captured voices from beyond. In the past, people tried to make contact with ghosts through mediums and spiritualists and seances that were often clearly frauds. Today, investigators are taking a much more high-tech approach. A worldwide organization of over 300 researchers is now working in the area of EVP, electronic voice phenomena, where voices, supposedly from ghosts, have been imprinted directly on audio recording tape. Please try to speak. Please try to give us a message. Please tell me who is here. Please try to give us your name. The time is 11.50 a.m. Sarah Estep recording. Sarah Estep is the founder of the American Association of Electronic Voice Phenomena. She considers herself a modern medium, attempting to capture the voices of the dead on audio tape. The microphones are yours. Who is with me? I'm recording voices from other dimensions. I started a little over 15 years ago. As a psychical investigator, I was very skeptical about the phenomena, but I decided to try it and see if I could get voices, and I did after seven days. I started picking up voices on my own, and I have continued ever since. EVP recorders worldwide conform to exacting standards to eliminate the possibility that their machines are simply picking up ambient sound or radio signals, and only new, commercially packaged tape is used. Surprisingly, the ghostly voices are not audible during the actual recording process. They're only discovered later, when the tape is played back. 
and in some cases, the voices are recorded on the reverse side of the tape. Generally, the words are only heard once. We are repeating them here for clarity. The voices are often recorded at places that are reputed to be haunted. The Westminster Church and Burying Ground in Baltimore is one of the oldest in America. Many of the graves here date back to the 1700s. Edgar Allan Poe is buried here, alongside his young wife, Virginia. Beneath the church, catacombs reach deep into the earth. According to parish records, many of the people entombed here met a violent death. Legend has it the place is haunted. When Sarah Estep came to the catacombs, she recorded these voices. I was here a few years ago, and I picked up the message, we leave the soul right down here. I'd like to speak. We'd love to hear from you. And a message for us. Well, there's a skull right down. Well, there's a skull right down. Point Lookout Light stands on an open promontory on the western shore of the Chesapeake Bay. Many instances of paranormal phenomena have been reported in this desolate place, events that may reflect the area's tragic past. During the Civil War, 50,000 Confederate prisoners captured at Gettysburg were held here. Forced to endure freezing cold, disease, and starvation, thousands died and were buried in mass graves near the lighthouse. The prisoners were brought here largely by steamboats and were made to walk along the sandy beach up to Fort Lincoln, where they were then turned inland and marched to the uh, prison pen. Uh, over 50,000 Confederate prisoners made this march, and four, over 4,000 of them, it was the last march they made since they died prisoners of war. This has to be one of the places that I've investigated, that it's just the whole area is just full of activity. It's not just localized to one building or one spot on the grounds. It includes the whole area. I've never come in contact with anything like that before. The phenomena at Point Lookout seem to follow one of the classic patterns of a haunting. Some ghost researchers suggest that highly charged emotions from the past may actually become imprinted on the environment. And in fact, many people have reported seeing apparitions in uniform, recalling Point Lookout's tragic Civil War history. When I was driving, I saw a figure of a man dressed in long pants and uh, gray coat run across the road behind me. It was actually where many thousands of the Confederate soldiers were actually buried. Uh, I immediately returned, and when I got to where I'd seen him cross the road, there was no trail uh, coming out of the woods on one side of the road, nor trail into the woods on the other side, nor was there any sign of the uh, uh, anybody in the area. This has happened different times, always on the same section of road. I've never been able to explain this uh, occurrence. Over the years, many paranormal investigations have been drawn to Point Lookout. Photographer Ron Stallings took this picture inside the lighthouse. Next to Nancy Stallings is what appears to be the faint image of a man in uniform. Electronic voice phenomena has been recorded in several locations inside the lighthouse. The basement seems to be the focus of this activity. Some scientists believe EVP may be caused by the researchers themselves imprinting on the tape through psychokinesis or as the result of electronic interference. But there is one aspect of EVP that defies explanation. When the recorder asks a specific question and gets a direct answer. Here in the basement of the lighthouse, I recorded the clear voice of a young boy that said, I was seeing the war. Were you a soldier here? 
I don't see you no more. I don't see you no more. Coming up next, the horrifying real-life investigation that led to the best-selling thriller and motion picture, The Entity. What we saw, we were able to get on film. The following program deals with a controversial subject. The theories expressed are not the only possible interpretation. The viewer is invited to make a judgment based on all available information. In the quest for evidence, two researchers from UCLA got more than they bargained for. Carrie Gaynor and Dr. Barry Taff were witness to one of the most celebrated cases in ghost hunting history, the Entity case. It was later popularized in a book and a film called The Entity. But what the real investigators found when they met the victim of the haunting was more bizarre and more compelling than any movie. When I went over to her house, we conducted about a two-hour interview, and during that time, she told us a lot of interesting experiences, but I knew she was holding something back. And at the end of the interview, she finally admitted to us that she was attacked and raped by the ghost. At that time, we thought she was probably crazy. The events that then transpired over the next 10 weeks were chronicled in the Journal of the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers, including the night the investigators went from being skeptics to true believers. The lady screamed out, it's in my bedroom. We ran in there. She shouted out, it's over in the corner. We fired our Polaroid camera in the direction that she said. We didn't see anything, but the picture came out bleached out white completely. She shouted out again, it's in the corner. Again, we fired our camera and it was bleached out completely. At that point, I thought the camera was just malfunctioning. I waited till she said it was gone and I took two control pictures. Those pictures are perfectly normal pictures. The only difference, she said it was in the corner in the first ones, and in these, she said it was gone. A few moments later, we felt a cold breeze of air coming through the door, accompanied by a horrible stench, a stench so foul, some people were vomiting. We fired the camera in the direction that that breeze was flowing towards us, and again, the picture was bleached out completely, except at the bottom of the doorway, you can see a little round ball of light. A few minutes later, she screamed out, it's right in front of my face. We fired the camera and the face was completely obliterated. But you can see the curtains behind her. You can see her dress. She shouted out again, it's right in front of my face. Again, the face is completely obliterated. Now those were her exact words, it's right in front of my face. Once again, I wanted a control picture. I waited till she said it was gone and I took the final picture. And this is a perfect, normal picture. It's just dark because we didn't adjust the setting. There's a scratch on it, which we put on it when we tried to clean it a little bit. But otherwise, it's a normal picture. The only difference between these two, in one, she said it was in front of my face, in the other one, she said it was gone. Even with these pictures, Gaynor still had trouble convincing his colleagues at UCLA that he was on to something significant. Initially, they would say, well, you're hallucinating. So then I would look at them and say, well, we've got 20 witnesses. And they would say, well, then it's obviously mass hallucination. Gaynor returned to the house a number of times, bringing more witnesses with him. And the eerie phenomenon became even more pronounced. We started seeing balls of light lighting up the walls. And everybody in the room would see this. And the lights would get bigger and bigger and brighter and brighter. And at some point, I finally started talking to it. And I said, well, if you're really here, come off the wall because what I was concerned was that somebody in the room was faking it and they were projecting the light onto the wall. Well, when I asked that question, the light lifted off the wall, floated into the middle of our room, started spinning and twisting and expanding in different directions simultaneously. It had full parallax. We could see it from all sides. And I had nine professional photographers set up in the room that were shooting it from all sides. The lights came in, it was like, it almost come in like in a, in, a, in a state of anger. It almost came, all right, all right, here I am. This is me. And it came in and it kind of did a little thing in the group, and then it was gone. It was the most extraordinary thing we've ever come across. It happened over and over again. We experienced a plethora of phenomena during that investigation. The part that interested me the most was the fact that um, what we saw, we were able to get on film. The photographers at that session had only limited success capturing the entity on film with one notable exception. What we see here are reverse arcs of light. One arc goes right here, another arc goes right here. Now the reason this picture is so important to us is that the arc on the wall, if it were really on the wall, 
would be bent because those two walls there are perpendicular. It's not bent, which means the arc is floating in space. The significance for that, of that for us as researchers is, of course, that that means it's dimensional and very, very difficult to fake. This was not somebody with a flashlight shining it on a wall. That light is in empty space. The negative of this photo was authenticated by popular photography and was the only alleged ghost photo ever published in the magazine. Frank DeFelita, the author of Audrey Rose, was also witness to the phenomena. His incredible first-hand experience in the Culver City, California house inspired him to write The Entity, which was later made into a motion picture. All the instruments started clicking away, so I knew everyone was seeing this at the same time that I was. And we were ducking, and everyone was saying, oh my God, oh my God, look at that, oh my God. And then Doris started screaming, that was the woman who was being belabored by this creature, so I was screaming, I don't want to see your lights, show us yourself, damn you, show us yourself. She started cursing and swearing at it. And there, lo and behold, at that point, it started to appear. It sort of developed a kind of, it was a, a kind of arm was articulated, you could see sort of like an arm, and then a neck. And then of all things, a kind of bald head. Now this could have been our imagination, but collectively we saw the same thing, every one of us. We saw the same thing. But we don't consider our pictures proof of anything. We consider them uh, part of the struggle to gather evidence to try to uh, understand this phenomenon. During our investigations, we spend thousands of hours trying to be in the right place at the right time. In the entity case, for some reason, we were there. We were there at the right time. And we were experiencing the phenomena over and over again. Although some of the people there found it frightening, I found it very exciting and exhilarating. That's what I'm in this for. It's an opportunity to witness things that we've been taught all our life cannot be. It's a connection with the unknown. Traditionally, a haunting is associated with a place but investigators in the entity case always suspected that this haunting was somehow connected to the woman herself. And in fact, when she fled the house, the entity went with her. For five years, the haunting diminished gradually and has now completely disappeared. When we return, a team of paranormal experts stalk ghostly apparitions in a special investigation. And a man who claims to have contacted his dead child with his video camera and recorded it on tape. The study of ghost phenomena is still in its most primitive stages. We're trying to gather data that will conclusively prove the existence of ghosts is a time-consuming and usually unsuccessful process, often carried out in the shadow of disdain from the scientific mainstream. How exactly do ghost investigators conduct their research? Now, we'll take a look at the anatomy of a ghost investigation. We'll follow one from the beginning to the end. The investigation site is a Japanese restaurant in Georgia where customers and employees report frightening, unexplained phenomena. There would be a lot of weird noises at night, footsteps, uh, people would see things or lights would flash. Um, there's certain areas in the restaurant that just kind of give you the creeps, you know, make your hair stand up. There's a place back in the back part of this area that is just a, just kind of an ominous feeling where you just feel like you can't breathe, the air's real heavy. Mm -hmm. And nobody wants to go back there. I mean, we, we even have a few chefs that when they have to go past the area, they run. You'll see somebody like at a corner and they just barely see them and they'll be turning, walking away from you. And you'll think it's your friend or somebody and you'll, and call out their name and go over and talk to them or something and they won't be there. One morning I was downstairs getting ready to open and I saw someone come down the hallway and I thought it was the manager at first and I said good morning and nobody answered and I thought it was strange and I looked up and whoever it was just took two steps and was gone. At a loss to explain these eerie occurrences, the restaurant management contacted Dr. William Roll one of this country's foremost parapsychologists. Uh, they were having disturbances uh, that uh, resulted in their uh, employees leaving and uh, their customers asking questions. Uh, they were seeing uh, apparitions, essentially. So it's, it's a unique uh, opportunity for us because uh, as a haunting case, it's a sort of strong case. There were some 
definite phenomena, according to witnesses. To investigate the restaurant haunting, Dr. Roll brings together a team of well-respected paranormal investigators, each an expert in a different area of scientific inquiry. Dr. Michaeline Mayer, a pioneer in statistical analysis of psychic investigations. Christopher Chacon, co-founder of the Office of Paranormal Investigations. He brings a battery of high-tech instrumentation to the site. And psychic, Daniel Brinkley. Dr. Roll believes Brinkley may have a gift for making contact with apparitions. Since most of the apparitions have been sighted at night, the team agrees that an overnight surveillance will be the most productive way to utilize their diverse talents and equipment. This all-night vigil is preceded by days of information gathering. As in any investigation, the first step is interviewing the witnesses. In this case, the workers who have seen the apparition. Then Dr. Mayer has them indicate on a floor plan where they saw them. She next brings in psychics who try to sense the presence of paranormal activity. Some people, psychics, uh, sensitives, believe in ghosts, believe that they can experience these ghosts. And indeed, when we have these people walk through a site where a ghost has been reported, often, not always of course, but often they're able to pick up on the very sites where something paranormal has been previously reported. By correlating the responses of the workers and the psychics, Dr. Mayer hopes to pinpoint the paranormal hotspots the team should concentrate on. Christopher Chacon's first step is to take baseline readings throughout the restaurant when no apparition is present. That way, he'll know if any changes in electromagnetism, atmosphere, or light do occur that could be associated with a ghost sighting. The idea is to monitor the environment. Uh, and that's all the equipment can do. It cannot theoretically pick up the existence of some entity. Since there's no way we really know how to measure the phenomena, perhaps if we were to look at the environment, we might be able to pick up something out of the ordinary. A good analogy might be, we're not really monitoring the person who's walking on a beach. We're looking at the footprints left on the beach after the person walks by. Since no one knows how, or even if apparitions affect the physical environment, Chacon uses equipment from many different scientific disciplines, including chemistry, physics, and meteorology. With the high growth thermograph, we could utilize this instrument along with individuals who might feel a sensation, if they in fact feel a cold spot or even a warmth feeling, and it's not something subjective, it should in fact also be picked up by the instrument. The Intivac nighttime vision goggles will help me monitor the instruments I'll be using in total darkness. And it might be actually, in fact, possible to pick up an anomaly through the goggles because of the technology that is being utilized. For Dr. William Roll, the most important piece of equipment may be a magnetometer. He believes that there may be a connection between magnetic fields and human ability to experience apparitions. He theorizes that electromagnetic changes affect certain supersensitive people and that this sensitivity allows them to experience the paranormal. The investigation begins at nightfall. The first few hours yield nothing, but then Christopher Chacon begins picking up high electromagnetic readings in and around one hallway. Michaeline Mayer independently confirms his readings. Her statistical analysis has already pinpointed this same hallway. As psychic Daniel Brinkley walks through the restaurant, he too records his strongest psychic impressions in the same hallway Mayer and Chacon have already pinpointed. The findings of the three team members are further confirmed by a former manager of the restaurant who witnessed apparitions in this hallway on numerous occasions. When asked to return to the site with Brinkley, he's reluctant but agrees. And you said, I always see him here staring at me. Do we feel him? Yeah. Unexpectedly, he feels the presence of an apparition at that moment. And at the same time, the monitoring equipment is picking up even higher levels of electromagnetism. Although no apparition appears that night, the fact that each of the researchers has been independently led to the identical spot using different investigative techniques is considered a victory for Dr. Roll's magnetic field theory. The areas where the ghosts were experienced were associated with higher magnetic fields. 
uh, it seems possible that the witnesses may have been uh, uh, sensitive to such fields. All in all, the investigative team has been encouraged by the advances made this night. You might think this was a small result for so much concerted effort, but for the research team, this was an important step forward. Their findings establish a stronger foundation for further study. Dr. Roll's work at the restaurant continues. Coming up next, a man who claims to have contacted his dead child with his video camera and recorded it on tape. To deny the existence of ghosts is easy. Skeptics say, I'll believe it when I see it, and walk away. But the people we've met tonight can't just walk away from what they've experienced. Those who have had a paranormal experience remember it for the rest of their lives. But for some, the experience changes their lives forever. Driven by his own experience, Klaus Schreiber has become a leader in the field of paranormal video phenomena, PVP. At his home in Luxembourg, Schreiber points his video camera at the blank screen of a TV, which is on but not set to any channel. He sends the picture of that blank screen from his camera into the TV and begins videotaping. So he is essentially shooting a picture of a picture of a picture into infinity. Nothing appears on the screen while he's shooting, and nothing shows up on tape until he views it one frame at a time. What he discovers then are seemingly unexplainable images of human faces. It's already my calling coming. There she is on the right-hand side. There she is. Hold her. The images are truly startling, but the most shocking one of all is a face that Schreiber is convinced is that of his deceased 17-year-old daughter. He believes she is trying to communicate with him. There are as yet no explanations for the images Schreiber finds on the videotape, but others who have repeated the experiment have gotten similar results. PVP is one of the newest methods employed by those seeking a window into another world, and it's still extremely controversial within the field of paranormal research. But Klaus Schreiber isn't deterred by skeptics, because his is a personal mission. He's not just trying to make contact with the afterlife, He's searching for one specific person he thinks he'll find there. For those like Klaus Schreiber, who believe that they've experienced the paranormal, a desire to understand what's happened is often felt on a deeply emotional level. Those who investigate the paranormal are driven by different needs. A scientific desire to find explanations to the seemingly unexplainable. And in the process, to perhaps find the answer to mankind's deepest question. Is there some form of life after death? I know we live in an age where people say, oh, it's all nonsense. Well, it's not all nonsense. There's something still left that needs explaining, which science at the moment doesn't seem to want to look at. I don't believe, I can really honestly say, I don't believe in ghosts. But yet again, I can't explain to you why these things happen. There's something to be explained and to be explored. There's a lot we can learn about human behavior from looking at what these things are. I find it fascinating that we might be able to continue on after death. I find it fascinating that people might be able to move objects with their mind, that we can pick up information recorded into the environment, potentially. Uh, a lot of the things that's happened here, you can't explain. So, it's... To me, the next logical conclusion is there's got to be another force, another entity, something. But seeing this event, these two events, make me believe that there's got to be something more to life after death than that, that we, we bargain for. I think that this encouraged me to believe that maybe that this isn't all there is. To ignore it is to retreat into ignorance. To pursue it is to pursue one of the most baffling, enigmatic mysteries that we have ever confronted about the nature of our being. And in so doing, I think we have an opportunity to, to take a quantum leap in our understanding of ourselves, indeed, in our understanding of reality itself. 
the people who have been touched by the ghost experience wonder why it's happening to them. And investigators continue to search for answers. Their research and technology point to the fact that something is there. Just what that something is has yet to be determined. For Sightings, I'm Tim White. Good night. Tomorrow night, Fox presents a night of special presentations, beginning with a one-hour Cops at Mardi Gras. Tonight is like the calm before the storm. Tomorrow we can expect mass hysteria. After that, it's Cop Killers, a special edition of America's Most Wanted. Then... When we roll out the door, we never know what we're going to run into. Ride with the firefighters of Rescue One on Firehouse, hosted by John Walsh. It all happens tomorrow on Fox.